was great stuff. So, uh, yeah, thank you to the organizers. I appreciate um, uh, being able to come and visit and actually seeing the campus was very nice. It's very uh, uh, pleasant setup. Actually, I'm not a city person, so being out in the countryside for me is uh, uh, very pleasant uh, overall. So, and um, I guess this is the second in a sequence of birthday gatherings <laughs> for KR Srinivasan, the first being in Denver and now here. And only, I only know two. Well, sequence, I don't know. the <laughs> Maybe a converging sequence, I suppose until uh, 10 years from now. And so I, I um, made an appointment and then, and then wandered into Srini's office when I was 24 years old, uh, needing a job around the New York area. Yale was close enough. And uh, Srini was gracious enough to find some funds for me to give a lecture the first semester and then eventually some research topics. So I uh, have a debt of gratitude for his mentorship, uh, not just in, in the research area, but also um, I suppose that we during those years also spent time talking as people often do about various broader things about helping others and ethics and, and all the various side things beyond our technical realm that we should pay attention to. So um, so I'm going to talk about helicity dynamics um, in actually several contexts both in classical fluids and a little bit in MHD and mostly in quantum fluids. So the majority of the talk will be about quantum fluids. And this came out of um, uh, research then that occurred uh, really through Greg's uh, dissertation work. Where's Greg? 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 Greg, did Greg sleep in? <laughs> yeah, but he hasn't seen the Holicity talks or any. Okay, I'm going to give Greg a hard time. So, and, and Greg um, uh, discovered how to use these tracer particles to track things that happen in uh, classical helium at 4.2K when it's not yet undergone the phase transition, and then eventually we were urged to go below transition and look at what happened there. And, um, you know, I've, I've been blessed to have been worked with a number of uh, uh, people on the project. Enrico Fonda, of course, gave the last talk. And uh, s uh, some of the data that I'll show also is for Matt uh, Paletti's dissertation as well. And the 3D data that uh, I'll show toward the end of the talk then that came about with uh, Dave Mikeley and Inamar Shani and, and Peter Megson uh, toward the end. So the Holicity, for those of you that, that have not been... Um, bitten by the bug from Keith Moffat is uh, just a quantity dotting the velocity into the vorticity. And the three-dimensional integral of that is in certain circumstances, ideal fluids, no boundaries, invariant. And so um, invariants often constrain things in a way that one should pay attention to. But I want to point out that the helicity is actually in kind of a, a ladder of quantities that some of which are probably more familiar. So if we think about things that we think in classical physics as being invariant, the total mass, uh, momentum should be conserved, angular momentum should, should be conserved as we go up this, this ladder. Energy, of course, and energy conservation and energy considerations plays an important role. Even when things are not conserved, you often want to track energy or power consumption. Helicity is just the, the next higher one up from that. It's, it's essentially one more derivative from the velocity you might observe. And, um, and, uh, and I guess the one above that then would be the entropy, the, the vorticity squared. But the, the helicity as an invariant uh, actually comes about in talking to William Irvin about these things because of, of parity. And so we, we sort of think of parity as being one of the important uh, symmetries in physics. In classical physics, parity is actually conserved by electromagnetics and gravity and, and also in, in the strong force. Parity is actually violated by certain circumstances in the weak force, although it's thought that the combination of charge inversion, parity inversion, and time inversion are probably likely absolutely conserved by all physical laws. If they don't, the uh, uh, Lorentz symmetry is broken, and we think that that's probably good in all situations. But, but in classical physics, it's just a question of handedness. And um, so, so we think of helicity then as describing helical motions. That's where the word comes from. And actually, I was just out of curiosity, uh, since I'm curious about this thing, how many people in the audience are left-handed? So yeah, OK, so this is the two of us, buddy. <laughs> so, so, and I presume then, OK, so, so by default, then I won't have everybody who's right-handed raise their hand. Who here in the audience is ambidextrous? Okay, wow. Okay, interesting. So that's uh, different than than, uh, than many audiences. So this this helicity, of course, is uh, associated with the right hand rule in a way that if you change the right hand rule to the left hand rule, you'll actually change the sign of the helicity in the same way that you would change the sign of the vorticity, being a pseudo vector. But in any case, we're going to dwell on this in some length. The uh, so I want to talk about helicity statics to start with, definitions and the sort of invariants that come out from considering. Uh, helicity both in uh, uh, magnetic fields as well as fluid flows. 
and then what, how we define things with quantum fluids, although Mark Brochet has already introduced us to some of the aspects of We'll talk about helicity dynamics uh, just very briefly in classical fluids, and I'll, I'll just touch verbally on helicity dynamics that may be important in plasma physics, and spend most of the talk actually thinking, talking about, thinking about and measuring helicity dynamics in quantum fluids, thinking about both theory, and, and actually the main result of this talk is looking at the probability distribution of the local helicity associated with what things should happen or do happen in quantum fluids. So little h here then is just uh, u dot omega where I have not integrated over all space. And um, so, uh, so helicity actually starts in uh, Wolcher's paper in 1958. It's not the, um, the, the fluid helicity in this case, but it's the magnetic helicity. So the, the magnetic field is conveniently described by the magnetic vector potential A. That's the definition of A for magnetic field B. And um, it turns out that in ideal magnetohydrodynamics, that the volume integral of A dot B is a constant and is conserved as long as the, uh, for whatever volume you have, there's no normal component of B, so there's some boundary. Or you consider all space. That's actually uh, uh, equally true as well. And it actually plays a fairly important role in considerations of magnetohydrodynamics and plasma dynamics, uh, both in thinking about relaxed tokamak states and thinking about things that happen in solar corona. And, um, and, and it really comes down to the idea that magnetic flux tubes, if they're linked, then this integral is actually associated with the product of the fluxes and then some linking number. So in fact, the helicity, it's a, it's a, a value, it's a, a real number, but it also is associated with the topology of the fields, and that's the thing that Keith Moffat has emphasized over and over again. Um, yeah, one of my close colleagues, Tom Anderson, actually has a, what's a fairly important paper in understanding uh, plasma relaxation. And uh, for, for what it is, for, for a fixed helicity, if you relax the energy, you end up then with these force-free solutions, and they play an important theoretical role for which I won't dwell. So Keith Moffat then uh, wrote what is a, a plausibly infectious paper in 1969, The Degree of Knottedness of Tangled Vortex Lines, where he then derived, based on considerations then of ideal fluid flow, and I think he was, he was motivated by Wilcher's work, that the volume integral of the velocity dotted into the vorticity is a constant, again, under cons uh, uh, boundary data, which is more or less identical. The vorticity is not normal to the boundary, or you consider all space. And, um, and again, it's topological in the sense that the linking of vortices, let's say in a trefoil knot or, or link vortices like this, ends up then the, the product of the circulations times the linking number gives you the, the total helicity. And, and I guess when I say helicity throughout the rest of the talk, when I say helicity, I'll mean a density. If I say the total helicity, I'll mean this volume integral over some boundary. Now, um, there, there are several other, uh, you know, besides this, there's a cross helicity between the velocity and the magnetic field that an ideal MHD is also invariant. But I want to point out now, early on, that this idea that there's, there's some boundary constraint then says that if you have a real physical experiment with boundaries for which these considerations are almost always false, that you might expect the helicity to be able to communicate in and out of the boundary. And I'll, I'll briefly mention how there probably are aspects of understanding high Reynolds number shear flows that are yet to be explored and using helicity as a tool toward that. So uh, questions, comments? I know we've been saving questions for the end, but not yet? Okay. So um, in thinking about the quantum fluid case, then we have this uh, quantum mechanical flux, h bar over 2mi, psi star grad psi minus psi grad psi star. And psi then is an order parameter, which is complex field for the quantum fluid coming from, uh, uh, you know, the, just the overall quantum fluid state. If we think about something like rotation, in this case, capital omega is not the vorticity because it's the curl of the momentum flux, which are slightly different units, then we might think of a candidate being the momentum flux into this curl of the momentum flux. Unfortunately, the curl of the momentum flux for a quantized vortex has a delta function um, on the core, as, as Mark uh, pointed out, and so that's a little bit awkward. All the rotations confined then to the core of the quantized vortex. And when we go to take this dot product, because J is actually zero, it's actually a doubly zero on the core, for better or worse, that is identically zero everywhere in the quantum fluid. And so I have to warn you now that the entire rest of my talk is going to be a glorified study of zero, 
teased apart in various ways. And, um, you know, so Mark actually put forward a candidate for a redefinition of the helicity that's useful for quantum fluids. It's necessary to get around this problem that by any naive definition of the helicity in the quantum fluid zero. So, of course, the volume integral is kind of trivially conserved, being a glorified integral of lots of zeros over all space. Nonetheless, the quantum fluid flows are actually quite helical, and one might want to capture that then by other various definitions. In fact, the, the helical nature of the quantum fluid flow plays an important role in the dynamics and the relaxation in ways that I think Mark and I, Mark and I have discussed and is uh, uh, worthy of study, I believe, and I'll try to motivate it. Now, um, the gross Podiewski equation, a.k.a. the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, is actually a beautiful context for trying to understand situations where um, you're, you're close to being conservative, so no mutual friction. And this has been studied at great length by the applied mathematicians. So if you, the, in fact, the 1D nonlinear Schrodinger equation is known to be integrable and has an infinite number of conserved quantities that allows it to be integrable. So if we're given initial data, all those conserved quantities just allows you to carry forward. So um, th there's uh, mass, momentum, energy, and actually just various higher order products. There's, uh, it's actually some really beautiful applied math, if you're into that sort of thing, of the generating functions to get all of this infinite number of invariants. For 1D, things get harder as they often do as you go up in dimension. In 2D, then, there are invariant densities of mass, momentum, energy, and perhaps various integrals over, uh, over the vortices, since the vortices are just moved around without dissipating. In 2D, since they're all normal to that 2D plane, integrals over them, a variety of them, would also be conserved. So it's so 2D, Gross-Pitievsky is a fairly constrained as to what can happen. When we go to 3D then, we, we don't have as many invariants. The, the total mass is conserved, momentum is conserved. It's actually Hamiltonian, so the energy is definitely conserved for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, and I, I am unaware in the literature of there being any other conserved quantities that have been derived for 3D Gross-Pitievsky. Mark, is that your impression too? The, the, are there other conserved quantities that have been rigorously derived in 3D? Okay. So, as is often the case as we go up in dimensions, be it Navier-Stokes or in this case qu quantum fluids, things get harder as you go up in dimension. Um, I, I'm just going to conjecture that there's no non-trivial conserved density corresponding to the helicity for nonlinear Schrodinger equation. When I say non-trivial here, I just mean other than zero <laughs> being conserved. Um, there, there's nothing beyond that. Nonetheless, we want to go forward to try to, to un tease out the, the helical dynamics by, by using various helicity proxies. Now, um, let me talk a little bit about classical fluids. So in classical fluids, um, there's been a certain amount of study um, motivated by Keith Moffat. Cinnabur did various experimental measurements of helicity. Uh, William Irvin's uh, more recent work I recommend to you um, actually has some beautiful studies of making trefoil vortex knots and other vortex knots and then watching them reconnect and watching Kelvin waves along. So this water with, I, I believe, hydrogen bubbles marking the, the vortex cores. And um, uh, William definitely has movies on YouTube, so if you want to see some of these, it's uh, uh, really nice work. His papers are also very nice. This is from Collector and Irvin, Nature Physics 2013. So Ben Zeff, uh, in my lab many years ago, actually measured the helicity and its time dynamics using three-dimensional PIV at the Kamalgraf scale. And this is the probability distribution we obtained, which is close to exponential tails, although I kind of doubt that's what's going to happen at high Reynolds numbers. The, the Reynolds numbers here were actually fairly modest, R lambda of only 54. So I might guess if you go to R... No, I don't have to guess. Okay. So I, I know for a fact that if you do numerics at R lambdas of 500 or more, that um, uh, you actually get fat tails on the holicity density. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, Moser shared some data with me about that that probably should be published. So we're going to go look at that in the case of a quantum fluid, although having to use proxies for H since the probability distribution of zero is um, not a very interesting thing. That didn't teach you a whole lot, actually. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, and I guess, you know, the, there's actually quite a bit of literature about plasma dynamics and plasma reconnection and helicity, and, and um, as, as many of you know, the reconnection of highly magnetized plasma tubes in the solar corona is thought to play an important role in space weather and the launching of coronal mass ejections. And, and there has been some considerations of the, uh, you know, the fact that if it's ideal, you can't change the helicity, might preclude certain violent space weathers. So how the helicity is actually changing in the corona is an area of active study. And I probably could give a whole hour talk on that, but I won't. So, um, okay, so, so 
Helicity dynamics then in classical fluids, there's actually some very interesting things and I was reflecting back to conversations or cautionary notes from Srini when we were building the large pipe experiment is in that you cautioned me, make sure it doesn't have any inlet swirl because it takes a long, a very long time for that to decay. And I actually pulled up some old papers on that that if I don't run out of time, I'll show you at least one graph. So why does the swirl take so long to decay in pipe flow? Shouldn't it, shouldn't it be very frictional in high Reynolds number pipe flow? Yeah, so, okay, and, and, and maybe we'll come back to that and discuss perhaps over lunch as well. Um, uh, yeah, and actually, there, in, in seeing some recent talks on shear flow transition by Dwight Barkley, he actually gets states in plain pose flow that propagate orthogonally, but they have mirror states that propagate in the opposite direction. And I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that those states have a net helicity and they have an absolutely signed net helicity. And I think that uh, there are helicity considerations that have yet to be discovered in, in shear flows. Okay, so, so we're using particles uh, that at high particle density skeletonize the vortices to use Greg's term so that the vortices don't move. At medium particle densities give dotted lines phenomena we don't uh, well understand. And at low particle densities then are thought to disturb the state less. So we progressively over time went to lower densities and eventually to nanoparticles and tried to get a system that tells us more about the helium and less about the particles. Um, in principle, the particles aren't passive, uh, but so one has to concern oneself with that. The uh, experiments then that, that, that I'm gonna show you data from at the very end were motivated by the work that en Enrico showed and that Enrico was involved with where we saw Kelvin waves being generated by reconnection, and we saw then the, the importance of that, perhaps in long-range transport of, uh, and, and the relaxation of vortices, but all of the experiments were done in projection with laser sheets and just looking at it. And, and the projection effects actually caused us quite a bit of distress in trying to, to analyze the events because they're actually fully 3D events that you have to then concern yourself, well, how was it rotated and what are the various angles? And I'm sure you recall the many hours and hours we spent as a group debating how we were going to deal with the fact we actually didn't have 3D data. So we eventually got tired of that particular form of sport of arguing 3D data with 2D experiments and, or projection experiments and set up, uh, set up with two cameras looking in two orthogonal windows and volumetric uh, illumination so we get three-dimensional particles, uh, particle tracks out of that. Now we've never seen an event as beautiful as the one uh, that, that, that was captured back then to date, but we do have data from these 3Ds and, and helical data that I'll show you. Now, um, so, okay, so, so I've said that things are helical. They're helical for a very important reason. If you make a tangle of these lines and you would like it to be able to relax toward equilibrium, if the lines cannot cross, then you shall not, and not you shall stay. And so it's just impossible to relax one of these states without then being able to cross and relax, which is what Feynman originally suggested in 1955. Klaus Schwartz went on to do some theoretical considerations that then not only might they uh, uh, unknot, reconnect, but the reconnection, the high curvature that happens at the event actually resolves from a corner into a polydisperse collection of Kelvin waves. And so, so helical motions are generated by reconnection. And, I'm, and I apologize, I'm just going to say helicity is generated and separated by reconnection, even though that was a, a null statement in, <laughs> in some sense. So we're going to talk about helicity proxies for zero out of that. So motivated by Klaus Schwartz's work then, um, and, and Feynman's work, we went looking for reconnection in the experiments. Of course, we don't see the vortex cores. All we see is these giant boulders parked on the cores. Um, of course, I've, I've drawn it with the cores here. We, all we see is the boulders in dynamics. And so we went looking for this. It actually took us quite a long time to see it because we didn't entirely know what we were looking for until we saw it. And then we realized it happens all the time. It's, it's actually a fundamental flaw in um, doing science that if you go looking for something that's never been seen and you don't know what you're looking for, it's very hard to find it and see it. It's kind of a, a bug in human mental programming that precludes new observations unless you imagine what it might look like for a long while and, then, and hallucinate your science and then go find your science. In any case, here's the first event there. I think you've seen this a couple times. There, the same movie actually had a number of other events here. So basically these dotted lines come in and they, they have spring-like motions as they form corners and retract. And uh, one can quantify this in great length 
<laughs> by studying the separation between them and how that should, by dimensional analysis and theory, separate like square in time, and in fact it does. So, um, all right, so uh, that separation law bears out in experiments. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm going to show a plot that Enrico showed shortly. Just because then I'm going to mirror this thinking and the experiments and thinking about the helicity. So based on the idea that link scales are going like square root in time, this is a sort of caustic behavior. You expect at short times things to be moving quickly. The velocity is going like time to the minus one half. And actually from that consideration then it, it led me to think that the probability distribution of velocity should be heavy tailed. And so you can just estimate that using the, uh, the notion that the probability distribution in time is uniform and then just tr transforming from probability in time to probability in velocity using the, the absolute value of the Jacobian factor for that transformation rule. And in the end then, one predicts that probability should be one over V cubed, and that's borne out then by looking at all particles in a relaxing turbulent flow in a way that's very heavy tailed. That distribution is peculiar in part because it, um, the variance is ill-defined, and the variance actually only depends on the logarithm of the ratio of the cutoffs, both infrared and ultraviolet. So it's kind of an extreme case of a probability distribution. Although the cutoffs are, are not hard to understand. It's got to be cut off by the speed of sound. It needs to be cut off by some large length scale, probably of the typical inner vortex spacing. Um, okay, so now the, there's some really beautiful applied math that uh, Enrico touched on, taking the, the local induction approximation, which is just thinking about how curved lines with tension should move over time, and reducing them to similarity theories where if you think everything's going like squared in time, you can go into similarity variables and reduce what are PDEs to ODEs, and those ODEs are integrable, and so the applied mathematicians just presented us with a family of shapes of what are actually retracting wedges, or retracting, although a pair of retracting wedges is quite similar to what we expect reconnection to be like. So Enrico talked about a two-dimensional family. One of the, the family uh, dimensions is the opening angle. So we expect different opening angles to have different dynamics. Very tight opening angles have a scissor-like effect and more violent dynamics. Wider opening angles are more relaxed in some sense. There's less line tension to contribute to the event if they're already open. If they're scissor-like like that, you can just unzip them and release energy into Kelvin waves or rings or phonons or various channels. Uh, the, the other uh, dimension of the family is you can put dissipation in here and that actually has an important effect because they go, you can sort of see the Kelvin waves here. So these things retain their shape as they retract, but if you turn up viscosity, these go from these wavy-like shapes to parab paraboloid-like shapes, and so they simplify considerably. Um, okay, now I, I want to just uh, have a little bit of a digression just to motivate the idea that a single Kelvin wave actually has helicity. So, so Stepping back from quantum fluids, think of a long straight vortex, okay, passing through this room, an ideal vortex. So Lord Kelvin says there are these transverse helical propagating waves on that. And, um, and, and one can then just consider, well, what is the helicity, oops, sorry, wrong button. What is the helicity doing in that case? Now, if it's an ideal vortex, the vorticity is on a core, but is there a UZ along this vortex? It turns out as you turn up the amplitude of that wave, the wave itself generates UZ at other locations in a way that as we increase the amplitude, one can simply estimate, here's smoothing the core over some diameter, that the helicity density along the core actually depends in sensible ways on the wave number and, and the amplitude uh, and the quantum of circulation in a way that we expect whenever there is a Kelvin wave, it will be generating its own helicity independent of any actual motion along the vortex and that that intensity will go up as the wave becomes more nonlinear. So these Kelvin waves being generated by reconnection, one thinks from this consideration, generate their own helicity when they come into being. And moreover then, the notion is when they reconnect, and these are then retracting, and these Kelvin waves are launching down along the vortices, that we expect that the reconnection events actually have a, a positive, negative, positive, negative, quadrupole of helicity that's generated by the reconnection event and then launched to long range. If the dissipation is low, these will just propagate out, perhaps being absorbed by walls, perhaps you know, just being carried uh, uh, elsewhere. But again, the, the notion is that, that I, this is, I believe, an important part of the relaxation process for untangling a quantum knot, if you will. <laughs>
and the, the uh, helical motions are carrying out a certain amount of energy. So, okay, now we're going to move back toward experiments and the, the primary result. If we take one of these applied math models and just run it and, and sort of from the wedge then to the retracting nose, to the waves that are passing down along each vortex core, if I park a particle along there, uh, and Nita Marshani then just did this simulation in MATLAB, if I park a particle and I launch this reconnection event, the particle will actually execute a motion that looks like this. So of course we're looking at particles, not the cores, so we all wanted to just see, well, what do we expect? What should, and we would expect then to see particles executing helical motions, so we went looking for those. Um, here's where then uh, we needed a proxy for helicity that made sense. I want to just try to quantify helical motions of particles, so it's not going to be u dot omega, since I can't measure omega. The particles on the vortices are actually not rotating as best we can tell. The fluid is slipping around them, being an, uh, a quantum fluid. And moreover, what we want is the u along the vortex, and that velocity field is also slipping around the particles, so the particles are not being dragged along by any flow along the vortex core. So I would actually posit that directly measuring anything like u dot omega in a quantum fluid is impossible. I could be wrong, but it's, having thought long and hard about how to do the measurement, I just don't think it can be done by particles at least. I mean, maybe there's some other technique that could do it. So we went looking for proxies. Um, you know, so here's a three-dimensional thing where there's, there is evident helical motions if you rotate this around. So how do we capture that? Well, so, so one notion we played with, which is rather crude, but we needed something, is say, well, there's a long axis to this from principal component analysis. We can just measure the, uh, the orbit along that long axis as a proxy for rotation. We can also then measure the velocity along that long axis as a proxy then for the motion along the vertical motion. If you do this, actually, it's very noisy. Uh, of course, doing experimental measurements, one often has to battle noise long and hard as part of the debugging process. And it's noisy for, for ways for the experimentalists may be evident there. We're taking a time derivative of an experimental variable. Whenever you take time derivatives, you amplify noise at high frequency, and that's problematic. So what we did instead was to say, well, the noise at high frequency in this time derivative comes when the radius from that axis is small, primarily, because the air in the particle position then gets amplified in the time derivative. So we'll just do a radius weighted, because our, our angular derivative is better at large radius, and then we'll just divide by the average radius in the end to get rid of the fact that we computed something with wrong units. So we're going to use this helicity proxy, if you will, an R-weighted principal component analysis. Basically, we're trying to measure this, okay, and having to work kind of long and hard to do so. Having defined that and tested it out and been reasonably satisfied with the noise figures then, we went looking for large collections of helical motions, and we, we worked to repeat what I would call success in understanding the probability distribution of the velocity in the quantum fluid. And so here's what that calculation looks like. Um, so if we take you know, a naive classical definition of helicity, you can then go forward to do the same estimate of how the time dynamics should vary for these quantities near reconnection, you end up getting t to the minus 3 halves power, and doing the same transformation of uniform distribution of observing a track in time to the non-uniform distribution of helicity, you need this Jacobian factor again to do the transformation. One obtains then an estimate the probability distribution of helicity should go like kappa to the one-third, helicity to the minus five-thirds. And so this predicts then, again, it's a very heavy-tailed thing in the sense that you have rarely extremely high values of helicity than most of the time calmer values. And, uh, and uh, there it is. So, um, so the water data of Ben Zeff then is shown here in the circles. And Ida Marshani's then proxy of helicity are shown the, here in the stars. And uh, h to the minus 5 thirds is in the, the purplish curve here. You can fit a slightly better power law to it, but, uh, but the, the, the units of everything get quite squirrely to, if you vary the power law off of some rational number. And so this appears to be a success overall. Um, I, I want to point something out about this is that I, I, I motivated the, the notion that the helicity was associated with a ladder of conserved quantities like the energy. It's very different than the energy in the sense that the energy is a positive definite quantity, energy density or total energy, where this helicity is, is definitely not. So we can take 
a, a setup with no helicity, zero everywhere, and we could cause events that just pull helicity out of the null to then have quite locally helical flows, even though the totals might end up being zero. And so you might interpret this to be, that, well, there might not be a lot of helicity until we start reconnecting, and then we're just pushing helicity out onto these tails. But you notice there was a lot of arm flapping in that argument, so you should take that as a sign. Uh, yeah, the, right. So it just basically follows from the same line of reasoning for the velocity minus, in, in the end, you can treat this as dimensional analysis or transformational probabilities. There's probably at least one more way to argue it uh, theoretically. But uh, yeah, and um, okay, so I talked about ideal MHD and helicity and ideal fluids and quantum fluids. And, and really, I want to emphasize the role of helicity dynamics in the relaxation of quantum turbulence. Um, and uh, I guess there are dissertations that are on our website and probably a, a, a modest amount of illegal PDFs of reprints. Uh, and some of the videos then we've shown are on the Lathrop Lab YouTube channel. Uh, and I guess uh, uh, much of the results here. Uh, the Felicity uh, paper is actually uh, pending me prompting it to Marshani to finish a draft. So, and with that, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker and take some questions. We have a few extra minutes here. I know that um, initially our uh, measurements, our polarities measurements showed uh, that in reconnection there was symmetry um, before and after in terms of how the separation distance changes with time. But more recently there have been simulations that suggest that there is no such symmetry. Um, I, I don't see you or Enrico saying that. Do you know why you are uh, ignoring it? Uh, so, well, I, 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 no, nothing to say about symmetries with regard to helicity, but I think that, um, yeah, so this came about then from this notion if we fit separations of particles coming into events or exiting events. That, yeah. No, 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 but I, let yeah. me just comment on this, yeah. that, that, um, that the, the pre-connection and post-reconnection statistics of A seem the same, and so that was why we said, but, but um, let me point out, this is a statistical result that then doesn't say for an individual event on the way in and on the way out is the same. And, and in fact, if you go look at the data where you have both, they're not symmetric in the same events. And I, um, I've, I've never quite understood why this was the case, because these experiments were done, I believe, around 1.7K. So there should be mutual friction around there. One should think that friction should affect that. So that's a, it's a... You know, perhaps theoretically they've nailed it down better than we have in experiments. Oh, okay, I'll, let's talk about it here. Dan, there have been theoretical work by Konrad Bayer and Lipniatsky, and they have shown that if the two vortices approach almost parallel to each other, that there is a critical angle that not only reconnection happens, but also a free vortex rings is emitted, or even several vortex rings. Have you observed anything like that? Um, so an excellent question, although I, th I guess I should um, at least say that the name Bob Kerr has also seen the same thing so that he's not getting angry at a distant place. <laughs> um, so we have seen vortex rings, but we have not seen vortex rings coming out of reconnection. We have not gone looking for that specifically, though. And so that may, that may be one of those things that can be observed if you make an effort to go about finding it. Uh, you know, one of the things you probably found is that is if you do the experiments with the particles, you may end up with some terabytes of movies. And we, we've we never had a good automated way of going to find things. And so we're requiring our uh, uh, machine learning hardware in the backs of our heads to go find events. And it's, uh, so, so although perhaps there are ways of actually training computer algorithms to go find events in the way that all of our particle theory colleagues don't do any data analysis by finding events by eye, they've automated everything in a way that we probably should, or if, if we can. Uh, hello. Uh, as long as there is no uh, reconnection, helicity is conserved? Um, well, I think, I think Mark Brashek showed data from gross that helicity is not conserved by the a helicity proxy. Um, the, uh, so let me, let me comment about that in the, in the case of ideal fluids. So we have then derivations by Keith Moffat that the helicity is conserved for an ideal fluid given certain boundary data. 
But those don't say anything about reconnection. Reconnection is not all that terribly well-defined in, a, in a, a theoretical sense in an ideal fluid. But if you thought about what that would mean in an ideal fluid, it would mean that you might have things like ideal vortices that are coming and colliding. And that almost surely then would cause things... I worry about the Euler equations. The solutions are not necessarily well-defined for sufficiently violent events. I'm sure that Keith's theorems about this would break down in the event of a singularity in the solutions of the Euler equations. So... Uh, decay in helicity is not necessarily uh, low, uh, high, uh, low, I mean, high K phenomenon. Um, so um, let, me, let me answer it in a, in a different way. If you have a boundary, you can just carry helicity out to the boundary because these boundary conditions are not then actually preserved by real physical situations. And so one should be able to dissipate helicity to the far field, if you want, or to boundaries by breaking the, the boundary assumptions of the theorems. I mean, in particular, where they, they have, you can't have the vortices be at all normal in the ideal theory. So if I have a vortex just going into a boundary, I can just take a Kelvin wave and probably launch it into the boundary. And then depending on whether the vortex end moves or not, it will reflect or not. You have those backwards. <laughs> so is there a tendency for knots and links to unknot? I mean, is that uh, some, and, and how do they form and how do they unknot? So, um, so to form a knotted set of vortices, one uh, mainly just drives it from equilibrium by some means. So passing the heat flux or stirring it up or there are a variety of ways to stir up a, a, a quantum knot, if you will. The, um, there is a very real estimatable line tension and energy per unit length for the vortex. So of course, if you want to reduce your line length and you, it, knots would interfere with the ability to do that. And so it, it ends up being, in the case of, of a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, that there's a downhill path through reconnection to releasing energy, and so that, and it's allowed, and so it occurs. Any other question? I have a quick one, in kind of in line with what I asked Enrico. So, so um, he showed some two-dimensional planar uh, images, but as I thought you had three-dimensional with two different cameras. Um, and now what I'm thinking is, if there are two of these vortices which are um, splitting up and join, reconnecting, it seems from your pictures that they actually fall, come out of plane. Is that correct? Um, um, okay, so, images? So, so reconnection in general is not coplanar. So, so, uh, Duell and Arts suggested that at the moment of the reconnection they actually form a pyramidal structure. Okay. So but it's a fully three-dimensional phenomena. Fully three-dimensional phenomena. That's right. So do you see some major differences when you look at 2D and 3D data from your experiments? Uh, not yet. <laughs> the simplest question. We are, and, and just to be completely honest, we have not seen as beautiful an event as, as Enrico talked about yeah. in the current three-dimensional experiments. I guided that, yeah. Uh, so the... Um, Okay, so sometimes in science, one obtains fortuitous results by being extremely patient and just watching an experiment. And in fact, in condensed matter physics, this is standard. Make 100 samples, say a prayer each morning, one of them will show something astonishing, and then publish a paper in science. And they're quite honest about it if you ask them, well, how many samples did you have to do before you saw this? So in our case, this was a, a, looking at a large number of events at low temperature and finding a fortuitous event where two long straight vortices happened. We have not been perhaps patient enough, uh, and also we've been focusing on the nanoparticles where the particle density is lower, which may have biased our fortune to not have seen such a beautiful event. Where our prayer could use some practice, yes, no doubt. <laughs> All right, any, any other question before we wrap up this talk?